That's weather Jill. He signed his photographs at the end of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by breaking the ice. Everybody's going to get a pair of gloves. Okay? When you get those gloves, put them on. All right? We're going to walk around and get some gloves. <laughs> so, probably not going to be the best fit, but it'll be something that we're not trying to sew or uh, thread needles or anything like that here. Just as long as you can get your hand in there, it's perfect for you. All right, so what we're going to do after we get the gloves passed out, I'm going to come through and I'm going to spray a little bit of shaving cream on the hand, okay? The point of this is that we're going to rub the shaving cream in the gloves, we're going to shake each other's hands, and then we're going to try to take the gloves off, all right? And basically the point of this is, is to see if you can do it without exposing yourself. We'll talk about what you're exposing yourself to here in just a second, okay? Hepatitis. Blood 
hepatitis, hepatitis. HIV. HIV. Those are the two big ones, right? Yes, good. Um, what what types of things carry these diseases? What? How should we be exposed to it? Body fluids. What? Like what? Blood. Urine. Feces. Yes. Okay. All these things. Saliva. Good. How can we get contaminated? If I touch, yeah. So if I touch some blood, do I have to worry about a contamination? Yeah. Yes. Potentially, right? If I have an open wound, I definitely could have had some contamination. All right. If I have intact, closed skin, and I come in contact that with that, it's disgusting, but it would be a low contamination risk. Okay. As long as I have full intact skin. So that's why it's important for us to know: is it a true exposure? All right, we're going to treat all of them seriously, and then, of course, when we get the proper um, the proper exposure plan and know how to to, um, it, to treat that and go forward with it, the doctors and, and nurses can tr find out if it's a true exposure that we need to do treatment with. Okay. Um, what do we? Does anybody in here know the procedure for contacting your exposure plan? Does anybody know that? I know you guys don't know that because we learned that last class. Okay, so what my homework is, what our homework is to you guys, is find out if you get an exposure, what are you supposed to do? So to okay. notify your supervisor. Notify supervisor. Good, I like that. First thing you should do is clean it off. Right. Soap and water. Okay. Hand sanitizer is great, but it's only good until you get to soap and water. You're still going to need that soap and water to get rid of that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, so you, right, you're right. So start with the hand sanitizer, and then once you get to running water, definitely do that. How long should you wash your hands for? Minimum. Two minutes. Two minutes. Sixty <laughs> seconds is the bare minimum. Okay. Anything more than that is of course going to be beneficial. All right. You're going to sit there for an hour and wash your hands, but you want to make sure that you're getting your hands washed, and you're doing it regularly. Okay. There's songs that they teach kids to sing and things like that, um, but you want to make sure you're getting, you're taking care of that. Yeah. Uh, how about your procedure for cleaning your buses up if you have some type of bodily fluids? Gloves. 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 Do they give you some type of cleaner? No. Okay. So Lysol, Lysol, we talked about last class, so Lysol is good if you know how to properly do it. Okay. Ashley had brought up a good point our last class that um, you have to follow the directions. If you are spraying a area with Lysol, it has to be saturated and it has to sit for a certain amount of time before it can actually kill what you're trying to kill. Okay. So Clorox wipes are a good idea for you guys to get on there. Again, the surface has to be saturated and dry before we can consider it, it, it treated. Okay. Um, <coughs> what else? Uh, there are four different types or four different ways that you can become exposed to something. Um, Melissa touched on it a little bit, but there are four specific ones can anybody tell me one of them? One of the ways you could potentially be exposed to something. Happening okay. in your how, body. How could you be exposed to it? Injection. Okay, touch it. So absorption can come through your skin. Right, Injection. touching it. All right, what's another way you could be exposed to it? Inhaling it, right? You breathe it in. Injection. All right, there's two more ways. What was what did you say? How did someone say it? In your eyes. Okay, all right, so that's absorption again, right? There's two more ways that I'm thinking specifically. All right. What what about the lady over here that got some shaving cream in her mouth? Yeah, this is a delicious <laughs> sandwich. One of these dirty kids just touched. Ingestion. <laughs> okay, so eating something. That's a that's a great way to get contaminated. And then the last one is a tough one, but it is injection. Okay, so if uh, you have a child on your bus that has some sort of needle for whatever reason, maybe they're diabetic or something like that, and you go and touch it and you get stabbed, that'll be injection. Okay, maybe if something pierces your skin at all, that's some type of injection. Go ahead. Okay, if we have kids that child that diabetic, also, is this contact? Now, if, if it touches you, if it goes into you, then yes, it would be. So if you absorb it through, or if you take it in any of those four ways, so if it's ingestion, you get it in your mouth, you eat it, okay? If you inject it, all right, if it gets under your skin for whatever reason, that's one of the ways. Um, if you absorb it through your skin, if it goes through contact of your skin, your pores are great for taking things in. Um, and then the in inhalation, so if you breathe it in, that's another way. Um, there are a lot of things that we can breathe in that we can't see, and we have no idea are there, and you can become very ill, all right? So that's something very careful to be attentive to, that if you are dealing with a child that either is bleeding or is sick or something like that, that you're keeping your face covered to some extent. So if you have masks or gloves, as much as you can to protect yourself is the best you can do. How many of you, when you drive, um, wear pants? Who wears pants when they drive their bus? Pants, like full leg pants. Yeah. Pants. 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 P
Um, so if you so full leg pants are phenomenal um, because the less skin that you have potentially exposed to something, the better. Right, we want to keep ourselves as covered as we can when we're driving our buses. I know it's hot, I know it gets warm, um, but we as, as first responders, specifically our EMTs, paramedics, firefighters, we always wear pants, okay, to keep our legs from getting exposed to something that could be potentially dangerous. All right, so the less skin cut, the less skin that is showing, the safer that we are, okay, and that's a great rule of thumb to stick by. Uh, one of the things that we talked about during our last class is making sure you guys have gloves on your bus. Um, I know you mentioned if you come across some sort of blood or something like that, you put gloves on, but it's great to just have gloves available to you. And some of you may not have that on your bus, so have it accessible to you. Okay, you all just practice putting on gloves and taking off gloves properly. Keep some on your bus, right? That's the easiest way to keep yourself safe from getting into something. Um, how many of you wash your hands every time you get on or off your bus? All right, so a couple people, okay. Okay, especially when you get off. Maybe not every time I get off, but when right. I get off, yeah. Good. So one of the ways that, that we can, you know, a lot of people think, well, I don't put my fingers in my mouth, so I'm not going to ingest anything. Okay, but if you're not washing your hands every time you get on and off that bus, if you go and eat breakfast, or you go and eat lunch, or you go and eat dinner, you're potentially putting your hands near your mouth, and something that you got on your hands at 6 a.m. in the morning and you still haven't washed them, and now it is 6 p.m. at night, could potentially still transfer over and get into your mouth, and you could still ingest it. <clears throat> so it's very important, like Melissa talked about earlier, making sure that you are washing your hands, all right? That 60 seconds is extremely important. Hand sanitizer is great, but it's not as good as washing your hands, so make sure when you're getting on and off your bus that you are washing your hands, that you're keeping as clean as you can. Um, Melissa, can you shoot your little fact in there real quick? Your, your time frame? Yeah, so um, hepatitis, does anybody know how long it can survive out of the body on a hard surface? Mm -hmm. It can live it just up to seven days. So think about that if you ever have blood on your ambulance. That if somebody has hepatitis, it could be living in that blood for up to seven days. Pretty scary thought. So we want to make sure that we're keeping our ambulances, our ambulance. Yeah, those two. They're clean too. But the, <laughs> your bosses uh, clean and, and make sure that you are doing some disinfectant if you do have bodily these are our go-to um, drivers when we go to our ambulance buses. Right. <laughs> uh, HIV, uh, it does die with, uh, within seconds of hitting the air as long as it's not a big pool of blood. Um, but we really still want to make sure that we're, we're disinfecting and getting our areas clean. How many of you pretty regularly wipe down your bus? Be honest. How many of you actually go around and wipe down your seats? Yes. All right. So everybody else, I'm assuming that you don't wipe down your buses. Is that, is that fair? All right, good. Um, so make sure that you are, I mean, it doesn't have to be daily, but at least if something happens, it's wiping it down. But I would recommend at least weekly to go around your seats and just very simply wipe them down. I mean, it's a very simple thing. I'm glad if you do it. If you don't, I would definitely institute it um, because it's very simple. Something you get into the habit of doing at the end of the day, Friday or whatever your last day of Friday is, go around and just wipe your seats down. Okay, that's very simple, but those back those surfaces just keep bacteria and they keep those the, those nasty little boogers that those kids have and, yeah. and the vomit and the yeah. and whatever else you could have on your bus, they keep it all there. Right? So clean up. I mean that's the best thing you can do to one, keep yourself safe, but two, to keep everybody else from getting sick. Okay? Um, what are what are some uh, common injuries that you guys see on your buses? Nose please, okay. Anybody else? Some common injuries you see on your buses. Kids trip a lot. Kids trip a lot. Okay, trip they fall up the steps. steps. Right. All right, they're down on the steps. All right, they're down on the windows. Get their heads on the windows. Okay. It's funny. I feel all like we had right? all these responses yeah. the last time we were here. So, so I guess I I guess with that with with seeing the common injuries, you guys know how to handle little scrapes and bruises and stuff, right? Just putting a little compress on it or something like that, or a band aid, or even a rat. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it just makes the kids feel good when you got the SpongeBob band aid put right on their knee. And they're good people now, right? They're, they're going to be happy. And they said, My bus driver's pretty damn cool. Ooh, pretty cool. Can <laughs> you edit that one out for me? Awesome. Appreciate it. <laughs> so, and th so that brings me up to a point. Does everybody know, first off, do we have a first aid kit on the bus? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Do we all have a fairly similar first aid kit? Yes. Okay. 
So can everybody tell me what is in the first aid kit? No. Nope. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for it. Right. Most of the time it's band-aids and gloves. Uh, yeah, gloves and have gauze. So a tape. Is there some tape or something? No. You say gauze. Like 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 right. Ice packs or anything like that? No. Vomit little thing you need to spray them. Okay. Cool. So the the good thing about knowing what's in your first aid kit is not only knowing what's in there and knowing that, hey, cool, I got a first aid kit, and it's awesome. But, but knowing, knowing what we can do with our first aid kit, you know, uh, knowing what our capabilities are, you know, what, what do we need to call 911 for at that point? You know, we can handle the, the kid who fell off the stairs and scraped his knee. We can handle the, the, the little girl who fell out of her seat because we were driving real fast. Nah, anybody? <laughs> Competition? Or that one kid <laughs> that you just accidentally hit the brakes on when they were standing. That's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, in all seriousness, yeah. 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 what can we wrap up? What can we put ice on? What can we um, What can we get cleaned up? What can we handle with with just what we have? You know, what, what do we need to call 911 for at that point? So if we're looking further down the road and we have, you know, uh, a car crash, we're not going to be, you know, try to, you know, put a tourniquet or make a tourniquet on anybody or anything like that, right? We don't have that capabilities in our first aid kit. Now, we have the capabilities in our first aid kit because we got a big first aid kit. <laughs> it's not that big. <laughs> and it drives on, some, on wheels. But, um, so, I guess that's the thing that, that I want to point out to everybody. It's not, not only what's in your first aid kit and, and what the, the normal um, use of the first aid kit is, but also, like, what else can we do, you know? Um, do we need to uh, just keep something still, keep something from moving until the ambulance gets there? Do we, can we slow down bleeding at that point, you know, um, until until we get there and, and can put a tourniquet or, or something else, or somebody gets there and can put a tourniquet or, you know, something terrible happens. Um, Most of your bleed can be handled with a yeah. little bit of a dressing, a little bit of pressure. So I like... So at least get that started. I like Joe's next thing about... Oh, yeah. Nosebleeds. Yes. Oh. So, um, because that's a big one here. Yeah. Keep hearing that. <laughs> everybody, everybody has nosebleeds, or right? everybody seems messy. to have had issues with nosebleeds, right? Um, so I was in school last year, got out of high school. Um, it was a joke. Thank you for laughing at me. <laughs> Five years I've been out of high school. You can't say keep track. But anyway, so I was in school, and when I was in school, I used to nosebleeds all the time. Okay, and my father, um, when he was growing up, if you had a nosebleed, you took, you pinched your nose, and you tilted your head back. How many people tell kids to do that now? Anybody? Anybody? No, right? So what do we do now if we have a child, or we, if we have a nosebleed? What do we do now? Pinch it, then do what? All right, and lean forward, okay? Pinch it and lean forward, right? Don't lean back. One of the worst things you can do is lean back. Like I said, I had nosebleeds all the time as a child, especially when I was in school. Not because I was getting bullied or anything like that, but I just got nosebleeds a lot. Um, and so one of the things I always did was lean forward and try to do that after I was told them, right? So one day I had a really terrible nosebleed and I went to the nurse and she had a remedy which I've never heard of before, didn't even know it was a thing, and I've had nosebleeds my entire life. She said take an ice pack and to put it on the back of my head and keep leaning forward, ice pack on the back of the head, and I'll tell you that nosebleed stopped in like two or three minutes real quick. I've never heard that before. I thought it was some sort of witchcraft she did. <laughs> um, but it, it worked. It stopped my nose from bleeding very quickly. So I would encourage you guys, if you don't already, have some sort of breakable ice pack on your bus that you can use and very quickly get to. That way, if you have a child on the bus, you can use that method because it's a great one to do, and it's very simple, and it is effective. Um, the one thing, though, like I said, I would caution everybody against, though, is if you do have children on your bus that get nosebleeds, their parents may have told them, lean, for, lean back and hold your nose. And make sure you're dispelling that myth and making sure they know don't lean backwards and pinch your nose. Lean forward and try to let it drain out. Um, because that's one of the worst things you can do is lean back because then you get blood back there and you get clots. It's not good. No. You want to make sure you're leaning forward and pinching the nose that way. Okay? Um, like I said, my father told me, lean back. And I always assume that's what you did until somebody told me different. So just make sure that your kids are doing different. Um, one of the things we talked about during the last class, um, how many of you have older kids on your bus at some point during the day? Okay, all right. How many of you have kids on your bus that have cell phones? <laughs> all right, okay, that's, that's a good number, right? Um, so those, those kids are your resources, okay? You can use those kids. If something happens on your bus, whether it be a, a kid with a seizure or a kid with some sort of scrape or bruise or bump, and you can't necessarily get off the side of the road quick enough to get back there to help, use those kids. Um, have them help out, you know, ask one of them, hey, if you're older, would you mind doing this or would you mind doing that while I get the bus over and then I'll help out. 
Okay, use your resources. There's no reason for you to feel stranded because you've got 30 or 40 kids on your bus at any given time, and I guarantee one of them can probably be helpful. Okay, one of the things that one of the um, bus drivers in the last class said that he does with his students is if he has a couple older kids on the bus that he trusts, he actually has them learn how to use the radio. And that way, if they need to, they can use the radio to contact for help or get in touch with whoever they need Especially to. Especially if something happens to you guys, yeah. we need to have a resource um, for you guys. So well. I, I've never heard anybody do that. I thought that was phenomenal. And I would definitely encourage that. If you feel comfortable with some of your kids on your bus, have them learn something very simple just like that. So before we, before we jump into that, I just want to talk about some, some things that, like, why we would call 911 or why we would, would need to, to reach out. You know, some of the things that, that we heard that are pretty common that go on the bus asthma attacks, allergic reactions, seizures. Has anybody ever seen a seizure happen? It's terrifying. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've been doing this for years now, and every time I see it, I'm like, oh, that's gonna be bad. You know, <laughs> bad, bad things are happening, right? So, so seizures happening, what do we do? What are we supposed to do for a seizure? To make sure they don't get hurt. Just make sure they don't get hurt. There used to be the myth of, yeah. of putting things in their mouths and all that stuff, you know? Leave it up to the mom over here. Leave it up to the mom over here. Put it on silent. Sharon is Jared Paul. Shut up, mom. <laughs> so, so again, making sure that they're they're still breathing, just kind of keeping an eye on them, making sure that, that they're not uh, hurting themselves further. We don't put things in their mouths. We don't put credit cards in their mouths. We don't put spoons in their mouths or wallets and all the other things that you might have heard in years past. Just really try to protect them from, from when they're convulsing, shaking, from hitting their head, mostly, against hard objects and things like that. We can protect them, you know, let it run its course, have us come out. Right, call That's us. That's the best way to do that. You know, just, just keep them from hitting things. Let them, let them be, let them do their thing. Yeah. And just, you know, if, if they're getting close, you know, especially in tight quarters like a bus, like in the uh, aisle of the bus, just making sure that, that they're not hitting the metal rails and stuff that are right there. So hold their head, hold their shoulders, just, and just come up. Just I don't even hold them down, just slide them up out of the way. Yeah, just yeah, try to put stuff in the way. If you know. hold them down, it's going, I mean, all their muscles are tensing up, yeah. and, and we yeah. can create... Um, no, I didn't say hold them down. Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe like, yeah. yeah, that's fine. You can hold their head just fine up off the ground and then maybe put like a backpack or something like there yeah. to try and put that jackets, right? Kids yeah, have sweaters, kids have whatever. You've got some kid with a big down coat. I'm going to give her a dog's neck. Okay. The dog's neck for four seizures and stuff like that. Yeah. So, again, this brings up another thing that we were told in the last class. Yeah. So, you, so again, this brings up another thing that we were told in the last class is that she is very aware of this this person that's on her bus. Um. Is there anybody, any uh, special needs, um, seizures, asthma, uh, allergic reactions that are, are being notified on your buses? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Do, do you, have you guys ever had kids on your bus that need an epidemic? So, right, but I can tell you that as a parent, if my son or my daughter had some kind of special need, whether it be, you know, hey, she needs an EpiPen, uh, I don't, again, Coming from a dad who's seen a really bad allergic reaction, I want the the closest person with an EpiPen to know that my daughter or my son needs an EpiPen, and I want them to jam right in their leg because I care about my kids. (laughs) You know what I mean? So, so I I think it's 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 nice that they do. It'd be awesome if they did. I can't I can't speak for everybody, but I would definitely encourage it. You know, if there's some kind of special request or anything like that. Uh, I think the people in the last class were saying that they had actually been provided an EpiPen as well as the EpiPen training. Um, that's one of the things I, I kind of wanted to, to follow into, besides of being notified about it. How do we identify an allergic reaction? What's, does anybody know, what, you know what's a kid or, or even an adult going to look like when they're having an allergic reaction? What are things that look like? Right? What's that? The eyes are crazy. Right, there's that, that, uh, that look of panic almost. Um, so how about sweat rates? You get yeah. swelling, hives. Sometimes they'll say their their airway, they feel like their throat's closing right. up, I or, or I can't swallow, or your classic yeah. sign, like what they would tell you. Right. So over here, I hear hives. What what's a hive? <laughs> just like a rash, right? A hive, just like a rash. Yeah. Yeah. Like right. right. Absolutely. And where are we going to see these? Are we going to see them on the bottom of their feet? And Probably not. Really too. Right. Facing that. Right, but they're but they're in shoes. Where, where are we? You know, if I'm looking at you guys, where am I going to see? Face, face, arms. Face, arms. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what the rules are and all that kind of stuff, but lift up the shirt. Just 
look at the belly. The belly is a big indicator. That's where you're going to get a lot of hives uh, when people have bad reactions. Belly, back, um, again, like you said, the face and neck and the ears and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the simplest things you can do if you have a child that you think is having an allergic reaction, ask them if they've had one before. Ask them if they, if they have an epipen. They may tell you, I've, I've had an allergic reaction before. There's an epipen, get it out of my backpack before I stop breathing. Okay, they, they'll know. But if you don't ask them, they might not tell you. They might not volunteer that information because a lot of times kids don't want to admit that they have something wrong with it. They don't want to admit that they have an allergy or they have to have an epipen carried with them and that's or whatever. Parents are parents. And a lot of times, yeah. They don't want us. Right, right. So, so I think us as bus drivers, because we have them on the bus. Yeah, okay, you guys get them in the morning. Yeah, exactly. You guys get them in the morning, and, and so who's to say that, that they didn't forget to take their medicine that day? Mm -hmm. You know, or, or even at the afternoon where they took their medicine in the morning, they were supposed to go see the lunch or the, the lunch date, the nurse, <laughs> um, to, to get their to get their medicine in the afternoon or something like that. And they were like, uh, little Tommy is having a poker game in the corner. I'm going to that instead of going to take my medicine. So now they're coming to you at the end of the day without getting their medicine, and that's when they're having their problems. You know, they're, they're having it on the bus. When they're, you know, hey, I'm almost home. I can make it till I get home before I, you know, before I take insulin. Or, I, hey, I'm, I'm going to you know, not take my inhaler to school today because Susie said I wasn't cool if I take an inhaler. So yeah, just, interval access in cabins very quickly. So, I mean, you sometimes just have minutes before right. you're going to have total problems. So those types of things yeah, you but sometimes really about. if you react in that way and the parents say, well, we, they didn't have permission to do this, then you're in fault. One of the things I would, I would say is And this should yeah. be. Good Samaritan Act. Yes, that's right. that was. That's right. Was yeah. But we can also get so, sued. Well, I'll tell you what, I and didn't see my yeah, like That's all we think about suing anyway. Right. Right. But, yeah. that, but we have to have something to protect us also right. on a sheet of paper that they sign the You're at, You are absolutely right. You are 100% correct with that. Now, what I, you know, as far as a good Samaritan Act, it, it protects you from a, a legal standpoint at that point. Now, as far as if they wanted to come back and do a personal lawsuit or anything like that, yeah, I mean, I can get a personal lawsuit on you right now for not coming up here and giving me a hug right now. So, <laughs> so but that's that's the silliness of, of, of the legal act. That's just yeah, the and you know, one of the things I would say, though, is it, don't let that hold you back right. from saving their child. I understand. Right. Right. Because yeah. that's something, that and I see it. Don't, like, don't right. get me wrong. I have seen people that don't want to help because they're afraid of repercussions if they do help. Exactly. And don't let that hold you back because I'm going to be honest with you. If I had a child... And it died on your bus because you were afraid to do something. I'm going to see you quicker than well, if we, you at least try to do something. My right. aide and yeah. I, we've called Mr. Wheeler on a couple of things, and we, we're not going to get no trouble for all. Right, and, and it's fine. You know, cover yourself, right? That's what we do at the end of the day. And if and now, well, on that same note, I, I know we talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, when you as bus drivers, when, when do you call 911? When do you when do you call 911? If something happens on your bus, when would you call? Okay, a student you can't control. All right, when else would you call 911? Else? An accident? Okay. What else on your bus? Why would you call 911? Well, if one of the children had an allergic reaction, okay. and okay. you have to use everything, you're supposed to call 911. Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, because right. the, the potential for them to go back into it is still there. Right. So, so we might have to give second and third doses of medications. So it sounds like a really stupid thing to ask, but a lot of people don't know when to call 911 or don't want to call 911. And I'll tell you, 911 can be very helpful yeah. if you don't know what yeah, to do. Know what to do I mean, and that's a, and that's a good point. Like I was getting to, if you if you don't know what to do, you know, if you have a kid that is potentially having some sort of breathing problem and they can't breathe properly, or if you have a kid that you think is having an allergic reaction but you're not 100 percent sure, call 911. I mean, there's no repercussions for calling. Right? Call 911. Say, hey, I think I've got a kid that might be having an allergic reaction. These are the symptoms that I'm seeing. What should I do? Let them know I'm a bus driver. I'm on bus or whatever, and I am here. Okay, because that's a resource that anybody can use, and it's simple to use, right? Just call 911 and ask. Now, if you're driving and something happens in the back of your bus, I mentioned it earlier, how many kids on your bus have phones? And most right. all of them. Let them call. Right? Let them call. You know, if you're driving and you can't get off the road, yeah, and, it, and, and they might, but if you're driving and you can't get off the road, ask one of them in the back. Hey, you, call 911. Don't say, hey, did someone call 911? Can anybody call 911? No, point at one of those little guys and say, hey, call 911. I need you to call 911 and tell them what's going on. Because people tend not to react if you just ask a broad statement. You have to point somebody out and say, I want you in the green shirt here with the blue pants to call 911. And make them do it if you can't do it. Because that is going to save so much time. And not only that, they might get the situation resolved before you even have to do anything. 
something, okay? Depending on what it is, you just never know. But I mean, that is a resource that I want you guys to know you can use. Now in our last class, or the last group that came through, a lot of them talked about using their bus radios, and they would go to their bus radio before they called 911. Now how many of you would do that? Let's be honest. How many of you would call into your school that you're going to, that you're coming from, and say, you know, something's come up being for you. You can turn it back and course. go right to 911. Okay, yeah, you can. You can. So radio, that, that's right? where I was yeah. getting to. Yeah. Yeah. It's the yeah. very procedure that you guys have. That's right. <laughs> a, a developed procedure, something that is written down that says, if this happens, we're going to do this as far as contact 911. Is there anything that, that's specified to you that says, all right, I think I'm getting the, the head nods from, me, from everybody here. Yeah. All right, I, mean, I just want to make sure. It's simple. You just so, turn it back one night. Now you can't. Right, you know, it's very simple, but it sounds like there's a, so, a discrepancy yeah. between picking up the cell phone and calling 911 <laughs> versus flipping over to that joint 911 channel. The radio is so, more direct. One right. of the things that I will yeah, warn you yeah, about, um, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm going to warn you now because I know I how dispatchers are. Be nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, if, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, they hear you talking all the time. They always have your channel pulled up in dispatch for the most part. Not all the time, but for the most part, they do. And I'll tell you, they don't like listening to you. Because you all talk all the time. I don't like listening all right? to and you I'll, either. And I'll be honest, I mean, you do. Okay, but that is fine. But I don't want you guys to get into the idea that, oh, well, if I yell I'm having an emergency on my radio, that the dispatch is going to know to chime in. Because they may not be listening, or they may be listening to something else going on and don't have the opportunity to pull you up. K County okay? cannot. Oh, so Kent County can. Uh, well, I know Queen Anne's can. Right, but, Kent County but I just would, to be on that 911 channel if that's what you're going to be asking if you're, for. Right, exactly. So if you're doing that and you want to use your radio and you feel comfortable using your radio, make sure you switch over to that J911 and talk. But again, I'm going to caution you. You may not immediately get a response because they may be busy. They may have something else going on. However, I guarantee you if you call 911, they're going to pick up and they're going to talk to you right then and there that easy. Okay, so just keep that in mind. I mean, you have the resources, use them, yes. I'm not saying don't use them, but I am saying just be cautious when you do. And if you do have that radio and you switch it over and you ask and, and no one responds initially, call 911 say, hey, I'm bus such and such, I'm on the 911 channel on my radio, can you talk to me? And they'll very quickly, they'll be able to dispatch, they'll be able to pull it up on their headset and start talking to you through there. And if they feel that's the best way to proceed, then they'll do it. And they'll have you just keep talking to them on the radio. But just be familiar with what you have. Be familiar with your resources. And use the kids on the bus. You know, that's the biggest thing I want to try to tell you is you have these kids, and they probably know how to use a cell phone better than a lot of you guys do. So let them do it. Right? Let them use that phone. Let them call an island. Let them be helpful because they can be. And not only that, too, if ever you have some sort of emergency arise on your bus, the best thing that you can do is just be that voice of reason, that calm voice in the storm. Because a lot of those kids are in a panic just because they want to panic. Again, if you can just talk them down or direct a couple of them to help calm down some of the other kids, that's going to save you a world of issues. Just having them talk it through, you talk them through it, or you have a couple of students that you've identified on your bus to be those leaders if something happens, to keep everybody else calm, because that's going to do you a world of good, just having another couple of calm voices on the bus that can keep everything down. Because I, I'm, I've never been on a bus where a situation has arose, but I'm sure you guys have, and if one of your kids starts freaking out, they probably all start freaking out. <laughs> right? So have a couple kids that you've already identified that you can talk to and say, hey, I need you to keep everybody calm. I need you to just try to talk people down or keep people relaxed. You've got 30 kids on the bus at any given time. All right, right? I mean, 30, 40, 50 kids probably. Especially with, your, with, with what he's saying right here, especially with your, your middle-aged kids, like your, I guess your, uh, your late elementary school and the middle school, those kids are in that, that age frame where if you give them a job, they are not going to mess it up because they want to impress, they want to, to be, be held responsible for something. So you assign them, if, you know, first day, first day of school, you have them on your bus and you guys do the fire drills and stuff like that, right? Maybe designate, you know, you and you, you're gonna sit here, you know, I, I hate to do it to you, but you're gonna have a job. You sit here, you sit here, and that way you have some representative in the front or representative in the back as their, as, you know, make up a cool name. You're going to be my emergency personnel. Or you're going to be my emergency responders, and and tell them if something back back here happens, you need to let me know. Or you, you know, if I, if something in the back happens, you call 911, or you call 911, or you, you know, just have some sort of, of of assignment for them. And I can promise you, those kids won't mess it up. All right. Um, back to the safety on your school bus. I know we talked about it a little bit earlier. You know, your bumps, your scrapes, your bruises, stuff like that. You guys all handle it. Um, but uh, tying back to the like, seizure that, that he mentioned earlier, I mean, if, if you have kids that are having a seizure on your bus, it's hard to do anything for that. 
And there may be a lot of things on your budget that you really can't do a lot for, but just know the resources that you have available and know that at the end of the day, if something is going on, you can call 911 very simply and they can at least walk you through what to do. Okay, because those kids are very important to you, they're very important to their fam their family. And if I found out as a parent that you didn't call 911 because something was going on on the bus, I might be a little concerned about that. I want to know that. And I want to make sure you guys just are aware that 911 is not something you should be scared of using. Okay, I know we teach kids in school how to use it, but then we forget to teach adults how to use it. And it sounds really dumb, but I, I've been in multiple situations where something is going on that is an emergency, and I happen to be there, not in my work attire. And I asked, has anybody called 911? And everybody's like, oh, no, we didn't. You didn't call 911. Did you call 911? I didn't call 911. Did you call 911? Like, people forget that you can use it. I, I had a, actually a small fire behind one of my part time businesses not long ago, and I was the only one that called 911, and there were seven people there, all watching the fire happen. And I was like, did, it, did anybody call 911? It's, it's funny, people people forget to call 911, yep. or they assume that somebody else is calling 911. Mm -hmm. yep. And then you get the, the occasions that everybody calls now <laughs> and you get 50 phone calls for a, a minor accident on the bridge i mean <laughs> it, it, it's miss, but at, at the end of the day as, as a dispatcher as someone that is a, a, in the first responder realm of things they'd rather you call 50 times than nobody call at all for it okay it, it just, and they'll tell you like if you call in and you say hey I, i'm looking at an accident on 301 wherever they may just tell you yes we already know people are around and then hang up that might be what they do, but at least you have that peace of mind knowing that, all right, I've at least called or somebody's called, they know what's going on. So there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Well, who called? Did you call? I didn't call. You know, just use your resources and make sure that everybody on your bus knows too, okay? Okay, any issues with that? Okay. Like 15 minutes? So at this, at this particular point, because I, I, I really think that we touched on all the things that over here. Does anybody have any kind of questions, any kind of, really anything that, that you are interested in knowing, maybe that we can provide some kind of guidance on? Can you just uh, talk to how to administer an FEP? Sure. Yeah. So, um, again, this came up in the last class, and uh, when that guy's particular bus, <laughs> they had, the parents had actually brought the pen out and said, hey, this is how you do it, these are the instructions. With most of your app pens that are being uh, given out today, they all have instructions right there on the, on, uh, on the pen itself. Super easy to read. They're all kind of color coded. Um, it used to be that there was, you know, the the risk of poking yourself in the thumb with the needle and all that stuff in your thumb. Oh, wow. Terrible thing that. But with, with that being said, uh, now they have, you know, one end is orange, one end is blue, and then the instructions right there in the middle. Pull the cap. Hold it to the outside of the leg. You want to try and brace the leg as best as you can because it's, I mean, it's a needle coming out and the kid's probably going to pull away. Once you press the, the pen on, you want to hold it there for, what is it, 10 seconds? You want to give time for that, that uh, medication to be administered. Um, it's not a automatic relief or anything like that. You want to give it give it a few minutes. If it doesn't get any better, most of the time, these kids are carrying two of these EpiPens. So uh, again, the instructions that we got from the, or that we get, or that I got from the doctors in reference to my kids is hit them on the one leg. If it doesn't get any better, hit them on the other leg. How long would you wait in between? So um, personally, what five minutes? Yeah. You should so, start seeing some yeah. type of, of relief. Not maybe not complete, but they'll start feeling something. Right. In the first and the epi pens are designed to go through the clothing. So if they have pants on, sweats, whatever it is, you don't need to worry about trying to get access to their leg. It just goes right through the clothing. That was my question. Does Epi it go through the pants leg? Yeah. Okay. No, anytime Perfect. you hold the epi There's a press and release, you apply pressure on the pen. Yes. So, so you can a No, so it's actually a putting a pressure on the pen. Yeah, yeah. and anytime on. you hold the pen, hold it like you're going to, yes, you hold it like you're stabbing someone. Don't hold it by the top, don't put your thumb over the top. Just in case you get in there, you get nervous, and you and you hold the wrong side, if you put your thumb over it, you can inject your, your thumb. It's a very rare risk. But if you hold it like this, okay, like like Sharon's holding with her pen, just like that, and push it in, you don't have that risk of doing that. Does the health department have that nerve thing? So the idea that I, I just kind of popped my head, for anybody who is really curious about epipens and all that stuff, a lot of, um, I want to say the health department has 
demo pens where you can talk to a doctor or something like that. I think our school nurses okay. as well for the, wherever. Right, and at least are. at least get a general idea of what they even look like. I mean, this this yeah, is not that expensive. Right. All right. <laughs> just, just just if you're also really that. curious, YouTube has a lot of really great videos yep. step by step. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Depending on what EpiPen it is, some of them actually will have voice instructions. Yeah, right. Okay, they have lights yeah. with voice. And, they, and, they'll, they'll tell you. and a lot of them will walk you through exactly. They're not all of them, and depending on what it is, it may not do that at all. But just so you know, you make it one that will talk to you. Don't be alarmed. It'll just tell you what to do. Right. And the first thing, I guarantee you, if it does talk to you, it'll tell you to do is to call 911. Um, they will. They will say call 911. I'll be the first thing, and then I'll tell you how to do. It. So, it's like there's eight in mind. Yep, eight in the same way. <laughs> tell you to call 911. Right. Um, Any more questions? Uh, somebody, these kids can self administer too, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they are trained to do that. Some of them can't get the courage to do it. I've had kids where didn't want to do it themselves um, because or, it is a needle. But. Or not only can they not get the courage, but if they're if they're having a, an asthma attack or um, I'm sorry, a large reaction is bad enough to where they say, "Oh man, I need an epipen." Sometimes they might be beyond the point of helping themselves. So, they might not even you know, have the strength or right. mentation to do it. If they're if they're swelling up to their airway is closed up enough to where they're not getting the oxygen to the brain or something, I mean that's you're dealing with a, a little kid at that point, you know. Just somebody who's not, not capable of doing anything for themselves just because they're not getting the, the blood support anymore. So one of the best things you guys can do though if you've ever come across a child that's having some sort of medical emergency is stay calm yourself. Okay? Because they very much react to how you are reacting. And so will everyone and, else. And so will everyone else. So if you, if you can right, so if you can try your best to just stay calm, talk to them, make sure they're breathing, make sure they're apparent, they're awake, that's the that's almost the best thing you can do for anything. Because if you start freaking out or you walk over to them and you're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Oh, geez, oh, I got uh, that. They're going to freak. They're going to panic. And then they don't want you to help them. Now they're scared. And they don't want help anymore. So just stay calm as best you can. Now I expect you guys to be professionals right out the gate. But at least try to stay calm as best as you can. And don't necessarily try to alert them to any further issues that they may have either. Okay? Just, just talk them through what's going on, what's wrong, what's happening, or whatever that might look like. Just try not to panic them. Because, like I said, they will quickly react, and so will everybody else on the bus. Any other questions? How do we get? How do we get our school system to let us know that somebody needs that everything? So, um, <laughs> um, a couple of them in the last group, they said that if they had somebody on their bus, they're usually given some type of information about that certain student. I suppose like that. Yeah, definitely. If you have some type of, of child that has any type of special needs, including medical needs, you should they be notified. Give us medical yeah. Maybe you just But yes, you should. You should be. Uh, well, I don't know. I only have my own experience with my children that ride the bus this year in the county. But every year I get a phone call from the bus driver saying, Hi, I'm so and so. I'm going to be driving your child. I'm confirming this is where I'm picking them up and dropping them off. And this is the time. Um, so I don't know if all of you collectively do that, if that's like a normal practice, or if that's just, I got really good bus drivers in my neighborhood, I don't know. Um, I think we're all good bus drivers, but yeah, uh, I used to call everybody, and you get everybody's answer machine, so I let them call me. That, that may be a good time <laughs> that when you're doing phone calls to say, is there anything special I need to know about your child? Do they have any life-threatening medical conditions? Do they require, you know, any rescue medications? Um, because sometimes those things, when everybody's filling out all those forms after forms after forms, I mean, I don't know, sometimes people miss things, sometimes they slip through the cracks. So that might be a good time that if you are one of those people that call the families to say, hey, I'm a bus driver, this is your child, good line of communication just to say, is there anything special I need to know about your child? And even if it's just, even if you do get a voicemail or a, a, a machine, leave the message and ask them. You know, that, I would say, I would we leave call with that. Kids. And, and hey, I'm right there with you. But I now, feel like the, the school, it should be part of the school policy and, to and provide I, us information. And I disagree with you. I the only thing I would say they that do. is. They're supposed to for special needs. Some of the school, well, that's special needs. That's for us, regular contractors. Some of the schools are like, we can't disclose that. Out. We're part of the school system. Right. We well, have a child yeah. on the bus. So, it should be mandatory to disclose that to us. One of the things that I would say is if, if they're not 
not volunteering that information to you, it's still your responsibility. They're like, still your kids. But your child can't go to school without yeah, no, proper vaccinations. Yeah. It's just, you know, and I, I completely understand what you're saying, but I would do everything I can to at least cover my end so I can right. say, hey, look, that kid, he had an allergic reaction on my bus, but I asked the parents ahead of time. Right. I have the phone calls. I have the emails or whatever you did. That way you can say, I tried. Like, so I did everything I could. Here's my recommendation, all right, right here. We have two things to look up now, all right? Number one, our emergency exposure plan. All right, get that whether it's from the school, whether it's from an order the bus driver's order. I'm not sure how things work, you know, as far as that's concerned. And it sounds like we need to have some sort of guideline as far as what you know what needs to be relayed to the bus drivers. Because you guys are right, you're, you are most you know you are absolutely involved with the schools enough. You're you're the transportation for these kids and all that stuff. You know. These, these kids, now, high schoolers might be a little different, middle schoolers might be a little different, but these, you know, especially looking at like the elementary age and all that stuff, they can't tell you, you know, they, they say, oh, you know, sometimes I can't breathe, you know, <laughs> or something, or, you know, I got, a, I got a stuffy nose that's getting really bad, I can't, you know, it feels like there's a tiger in my throat, you know, something crazy like that. They're not gonna tell you that they have asthma or that they have allergic reactions or that kind of stuff. So maybe, maybe reaching out to, to your, your supervisors or, or, or whoever your uh, liaisons and stuff are, for the school would say, hey, if there is a special requirement, whether it's a special needs patient or somebody who has asthma or allergic reactions or somebody who has a seizure history, like you said with the diastatin, like get some kind of, of organized policy together that every year is the same thing that's not gonna change it. There's not gonna be a confusion between you and you over here, that everybody is doing the same thing. And that takes away from the legal liabilities that takes away from the, the confusion. You know, who's to say that, oh, that's, that's my, my creepy bus driver because he just wants to know about my kid's, you know, weaknesses. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I'm not I mean, saying that's the case, but. I had a little girl on my bus that, that had a, hit, a seizure history. Right. And I had her for three years and never knew that until Graysonville Elementary decided, hey, maybe you should know this. But right. it's like we know that, and we are going to be more right. prepared yeah. to react yeah. to Absolutely. the situation. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly right. And that's what right. I'm saying. Totally agree. From, so you might not be able to take care of it this year. I'm not saying that at all. Right. But if, if have to think about. as a as a group together, you guys are, I mean, we got everybody together on this group right here, right, to come and learn about these things that we're learning about now. That's what the, today is for. Get together, create a policy that says, hey, we as bus drivers need to be notified of any kind of special rescue medications. And then it can be up to the parents at that point. If the parents want to tell you about it, that's fine. They have They have a means of doing so. If they don't want to tell you about it, hey, that's fine too, right? Yeah, but at least there's like you right. go into the school and you try to be proactive, you know what I mean? Right. About a situation and they're like, Well, we can't disclose that information. Well, why? That's like endangering the child basically. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So so there, there should definitely be some kind of liaison system set up. That's <laughs> up here, I'm down I'm just trying to teach Not, you guys so the <laughs> you go into the school and they say we can't disclose that information to you. You know what I mean? When the last room in this room it seems like there's a lot of Different. I don't know how the setup is. So, do you are you guys county? Did you like? Do you you've work for special, the county? You've got special needs drivers here. You've got drivers from other counties. No, but like what you've I'm getting at is, no. when you want to be a bus driver, if I want to come and be a bus driver for the county, do I come to the county and I'm a county employee, or am I working for a private company? Yeah, no, county yeah, employee. Because right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like maybe that's kind of the discrepancy. Because some people are like, yes, we have this plan. Yes, we have this. <laughs> Yes, Two different counties, too. So I wonder if maybe that's the difference. So does Kent County. But Kent County, County, John, we try to make their head to some people. Yeah, they're teaching us a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. We're not going to learn what you guys have and what you're going to be Reeling it back in, though, one last quick comment that I wanted to make. Hey, everybody, listen to me. Up here, up here, up here. Thank you. All right. One last thing that I wanted to comment, um, I don't know how you guys do with your substitute bus drivers, but I overheard some of you saying, well, my, my such and such is driving with for my bus this year. Okay, if you have a substitute driver and you have information on some child medical information or something like that, you are able to obtain it, make sure you're sharing this information with people that are driving your bus. Okay, if you have different substitutes that are subbing in or whatever, that's information they should know. Um, I know when I got done riding a bus not long ago, um, that they that my a lot of times I had substitute bus drivers that didn't know where to drop us off exactly. 
okay? And that, that to me was like, I don't know where to drop me off. I feel like you're dropping the bus, you should know. But another part of that big piece of that is that medical information. You know, if you have that available to them, make sure they know, let them know, hey, look, I've got three kids on here that have seizures, or I've got a kid that's got um, allergies or something of that nature. So that way everybody's aware, and if something comes up, they're not caught in the dust or caught off guard and don't know what's happening, okay? Fair enough. Anybody have any other questions? Anything at all? Good. Exposure plan, first aid kit, and now this medical information. Right. Now, <laughs> just keep tracking on your homework assignments as the day goes by. Seriously, it's just it's just something good to know. My last question I have for you, because this is an experience I had as a kid. I'm a little bit older. It's a little bit older, Joe. But um, the the people that get picked up on the way back, you hate that. That's like the worst. So like you pass a kid this way and they're not out there at the bus stop and when you come back they're out there. Mm -hmm. Feel like the worst thing ever. Mm -hmm. I used to do that all the time. <laughs> 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 all right, guys. <laughs>